Welcome to episode 426 of Salcedo Paranormal. And tonight we will be reviewing Stephen King's novella and also the movie of The Mist. As always, you can find all episodes of the show along with links to social media and other ways to contact me at the podcast page. And that is Salcedo Paranormal dot podbean dot com that's s a l s i d o uh, paranormal dot podbean dot com always happy to hear from you all whether you have comments or questions or topic suggestions <clears throat> or stories of paranormal experiences whether they're your own or from others that you trust happy to either read those or have you join me on the show to talk about them thank you all for listening whether you are here for the live streams on Discord, or you listen to the podcast or YouTube feeds, or if you listen on the Trouble Minds radio network, KUAP Digital Broadcasting, I want to thank. Uh, and oh, and that's right before Trouble Minds. That's uh, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, and as of now, that is uh, seven nights a week. That will change eventually, but uh, that is how it is for now. So um, I want to thank Michael Strange host of Triple Minds Radio, and Liam Martin, also known as Rohan, of the Exile Minds podcast, for producing the show, um, putting it up on the network and putting in the music that you hear at the beginning and end of every episode when you listen on the station. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, there are some different ways to do that. You can always rate and review the show on your podcast platform of choice. And, of course, sharing the show is always appreciated. Also, I have written some paranormal fiction and nonfiction books that you all can check out on Amazon. And then I also have direct donation links uh, through PayPal, uh, Venmo, and then Patreon uh, that you can check out as well. Uh, there are expenses to doing the show, uh, equipment, research, research material. And then also, if you'd like to help support um, my trip to the uh, Mid-Michigan Paracon this year, November November 4th and 5th. That would be appreciated, uh, as again, there are expenses for that as well. And when I, um, in return for any help that you're all, all able to give, I am going to be, of course, either way, but I will be uh, doing at least one or two shows uh, with whatever I'm able to record while I'm there, and then just talking about the experience, as I have never been to one of these before. So... Really looking forward to that. I put a, a post in the Discord today about that. Um, I am doing my best to save up some money for it, but it is, uh, as usual, not as easy as uh, is, it, it, it feels like it should be. But anyway, <clears throat> so I believe that covers everything, um, and I'm really looking forward to this show. I've been looking forward to it for a little while now, um, partly just because I reviewed some of the other stories from this book. And um, so, really excited about this, and to do this show, I thought it'd be amazing to have a good friend of the show join me, and you will see why in a minute. So I want to thank, uh, and then welcome Derek onto the show. Uh, hello. Hey, James. What's going on? Uh, really happy to be here. Um, I'm excited for this. It's going to be a cool one. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, and, and you all will see, uh, if you don't know who Derek is, the Night Stalker, S-T-O-C-K-E-R. You will um, figure out the uh, the the connection, I could say, as we go through the story. Um, <laughs> yeah. Unless I mean, maybe you, you want to mention a little bit about that now, Derek, as far as... Yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel like it would be uh, interesting to kind of talk about our connection to the movie. Like, I didn't... Or in the story in general. Like, I didn't realize... Um, I had heard of The Mist. I kind of just... I, I'd never seen it or, or read it. Um, like, I'm not a huge horror movie guy, uh, so I didn't really, like... As a kid, I, I, I was in kind of no rush to see it. Um, and then uh, it kind of just, the title doesn't say, like, doesn't really interest me that that much. Like, the the mist. Like, okay, cool. I mean, that's probably cool. Stephen King It's probably an interesting story. But I wasn't in a rush, as much of a rush to watch it as I, as I was when I found out it was about. Like, I kind of just assumed it's probably like the fog or something like that. Just a general thing. But around, like, 2017 range, I was, like, really big into... Uh, the like tracking the idea of, of crafting old ones these like giant like, like godzilla size titan kaiju size monsters coming through portals into our reality and that whole theme and everything and how it's all over pop culture and i also 
I'm the night stalker because I stock shelves at a supermarket overnight. So then I find out about this story that's about, it all takes place in a supermarket the entire time in like an enclosed space and about dimensional rips and giant monsters coming out and it just couldn't be more up my alley. And I was just blown away that I hadn't really uh, known about it. It's just uh, too perfect. And I really love it. It's great. Yeah, and I, I was, at first, I, I can't remember this, I was a little bit nervous about, like, even approaching you, like, I didn't know if it would be too much or too weird, like, hey, you work in a grocery store, and this story is about a grocery store. Oh, no, uh, no. Do you, you know, like, I, 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 it felt, like, weird, but also perfect in a way as well. Oh, no, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. Um, yeah. Like, a little a, a little trivia for uh, for Stephen King, uh, for the movie, is, like, he, Stephen King, was in a supermarket and just was, like, looking at the big, huge panes of glass that are at the front of every store. I was like, wow, I wonder like what would happen if giant prehistoric monsters and huge hairy bugs and stuff started to attack the, the store. And it's just like yeah, I mean, yeah, we like that's the vibe you get walking around a supermarket. Like I I have just I have countless stories of or just like possible story ideas of uh weird supernatural things happening. It's like the supermarket is just an untapped resource when it comes to creepiness and and store movies and just uh he nailed it. He's a genius, you know. You know better than anyone. Like he nailed it. Very yeah, good. and and I mean those big windows. Well, they can they have reflections. So yeah. I mean they're they're they can be seen as mirrors in some ways. Exactly. And yeah. I mean, so, I, yeah. I, I I kind of spoiled like some of the plot of the movie with that. But just if you listen to this, like you know that there's spoilers. Um, we're just we're breaking it down. But just yeah, just to for the context of wow, this hits so many themes that I'm interested in, and just the supermarket's the biggest one. Yeah, like. The name I chose, my, my my superhero name, is based on working at a supermarket, and it's just a, uh, yeah, it's it's really cool. And there is just um, so many different moments where like they're picking up like weapons and sha- like shaving mop sticks down to to like stakes and stuff. And there's things that I think about all the time when I'm just I'm, I'm into weird supernatural stories and Buffy, and just it's always been the idea of what if like the supermarkets are the on the convergence of ley lines on a hell melt and the monsters attack or there's vampires and stuff and just uh this movie and story really scratches that itch. And just, uh, way to go, Stephen King. Just see the man. But uh, yeah. we can get into it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's a good thing to mention here. Um, this There will be spoilers in this show. It's, it's We're here to talk about the paranormal aspects of the story, as we always do in these review shows. But, um, of course, I mean, you'll still want to go either read the story or, and or watch the movie, because we won't, we won't hit on everything in this review. Yeah. There's just no way. I, I'm um, going to ask you first, like, have you yeah. have you seen the movie, or are you just going by the by the book? Because I, I have not I have not read the, the novella. So do you I, know I've, the... I've seen it once or twice over the years. I, I actually watched it like earlier this year at one point. Okay, okay. I listened to it anyway and watched what I could of it. Um, but so yeah, you know so I, so like, I, I do. I, I okay, okay, um, so I've forgotten a lot as well as, okay. as far as the movie goes. Right, so yeah. this um this will be good. Yeah. I'm sure as you talk about some of the things, they'll come back to me and then we'll go <laughs> yeah. from there. Because if you hadn't, like, that's a pretty big, uh, I won't spoil it now, but I was excited to get to that at the end because uh, it's a major, major difference. And I'm interested to see uh, your thoughts on, uh, or hear your thoughts on, on the differences. But yeah, I'll get cranking. Yeah. All right. So um, I found a, uh, a Wikipedia article on this, this book and or this story. It's really, it's a novella. So it's a short novel, which is basically what that means. So yeah. it's a good sized story, but um, it's not too long to review here, I don't think. And but uh, so getting right to it, the first paragraph for, for, here. I don't want to keep interrupting, yeah. but I just want to give as much uh, context um, as possible. Uh, yeah. So I won't give. I, I just have in my notes here like the cast list and just some background context and stuff, but I won't give all that now. It's just to help me. But like I also grabbed. Um, this, the movie was directed by Frank Darabont, and I thought like just real quick before the show started, I'm like, I wonder what else he has directed if he's like into this type of topic and. Um, I'm looking at it. So, Nightmare on Elm Street Three, Dream Warriors. I've never seen, but uh, he he wrote that. He wrote the Blob. He wrote the Fly sequel. So he's weird into like the Blob is like this weird Lovecraftian kind of creature, monster, slime monster. Um, Shawshank Redemption and the Green Mile. He wrote and directed those. So it's kind of religious connotations that we'll, we'll, we'll get into. He wrote Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, um, The Mist, obviously, and he's an uncredited script doctor for. Um, the 2014 Godzilla movie, which like which kind of introduced the Titans aspect to the Godzilla verse. Um, that was like the start of that of that universe. So, so I mean, I mean, 
he's seem, seemingly he's into weird Lovecraftian themes and giant monsters and stuff. So, um, he's a cool person to be wielding this the, the Stephen King story. But yeah, all right, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, no, that's good to know. I I don't uh, I don't keep track of or I don't really think about these things a lot of times. So, um, but yeah, so this story starts out with um, <clears throat> basically that there's this huge thunderstorm this one night at uh, over this lake in Maine. And um, it's it's uh, seems odd because of the the way this um, there's this thick and straight edge cloud of mist that slowly starts to approach the area. Uh, this is uh, Bridgeton, Maine. Uh, I wonder if that's a, a allusion to uh, the what is it the Bridger Bridgerton? Um, Bridgerton Triangle. Uh... Oh, the Bridgewater Triangle. Yeah, in Mass. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm, Bridgeton, I think, is a real place in, in Maine. Um, oh, okay. One of, the, one of my old supermarkets um, is, like, they're dominant in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. They have, like, 70 stores, but they only have, like, three stores in Maine. And uh, the first one they opened up there was in Bridgeton. Um, so, synchronistically, oh, wow. as far as supermarkets, that's a weird one. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so, so the, and the, the story starts, well, it's really focused and told from the point of view of commercial artist David Drayton. And um, starts off with him and his wife, uh, Stephanie or Steph, and their son, Billy, uh, going basically getting through this night of this huge storm. In the book, it even, um, <clears throat> they, have to, they have to camp out in the basement because the storm was so bad. And it, in this, the book, it, it, this is not from the, the, <laughs> the summary here, yeah. but... Um, my memory of things uh the the picture when or the bay window in the house is broken uh, by a giant tree oh yeah um so but and so there's trees down all throughout the area which plays into the story and co parts here as it gets further in and so the next day they um david has to go to the store and his neighbor through just coming over and needing help with the chainsaw actually um, ends up going with uh, David and uh, Billy, the son. And so there's there's trees down all around. They're hearing chainsaws all around. As people again, this is an area that's used to these kinds of things in a way. Yeah. Um. And Indeed. so they get to the store. Yeah. Go ahead. No, in the um, first uh, interesting that it starts out on a lake, kind of synchronistically, because Triple Minds just said that weird paranormal lake episode um a week or two ago so uh and then for the movie it starts out like the first thing you see is him um he like paint their painter or something for for big time hollywood movies apparently so like the town kind of like says, oh you big shot hollywood superstar or whatever but he just like makes posters and stuff i guess but he was making a, a poster for um for dark tower and he was like making yes. a like the gunslinger and um like he had like the rose next to him and everything, and then all of a sudden the the, the he hears the thunder crashing and sees the sees the mist rolling in. Um, so that was kind of cool. Okay. So like th those yeah. stories exist within this story, uh, which I love. And you see that I mean that's part of the the Dark Tower series. There's a point where one of the characters in the, near, near the middle or near the end of the series, where they they find there's and that series is all about portals, all about worlds yeah. and other worlds, and one of the characters. Uh, Father Callahan finds the book that he is in from a different world oh, that wow. tells his story from beginning to end, and as far as uh, up until he enters the Dark Tower story, and he's sitting there going, "I'm not a fictional character. What is this?" Yeah, I love that because he lived that. Yeah, so, I love that. Um, oh, I, I, yeah, definitely. Is is there? A dream. I was looking at like the some of the differences, or whatever, between the book and movie. Is is there a dream sequence, like a foreshadowing dream sequence that they cut out um, between the 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 book and the movie? Yeah, yeah. There's a um, David has a dream that night as they're sleeping through the storm of uh, oddly enough purple, like the this mist or this cloud. There's these purple clouds that envelop the area and. The impression David gets in this dream is, it's some. He he uses the word some god basically. Some yeah, I think he says like god, like like capital G god. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
and and it's coming and he doesn't want to be in the way of it and wow. but he thinks so that's just you know that's just a dream yeah so wow. but yeah definitely there are little hints at sort of um religion and not necessarily just a uh embracing of everything religious either just sort of people having thoughts or references to to different to religion really yeah um, honestly the yeah. the i think the movie gets is almost more or like overtly um with the religious themes and i'm not, i'm honestly not sure what the takeaway is supposed to be like we'll we'll get into it but <laughs> there's a lot of conflict especially in the movie between um the religious characters and stuff and deciding what what to do and everything and um honestly like it, it's pretty ambiguous uh like interestingly and to the good guy and the villain and it's pretty up in the air um in a very interesting way yeah so um so but of course when david and his son and, and then their neighbor goes to the store they leave the wife <laughs> stephanie back at the house because they figured they're going to be back in a little bit <laughs> um yeah. and so yeah they go ahead no no sorry go ahead. i was just laughing sorry okay um, so, but this, uh, this whole morning as they're leaving and, and, and everything, that white mist is just advancing for, for closer and closer to even David's house and, and the neighbor, uh, Brent's, that's the neighbor house and property. And, um, so they, they, let's see here. So they go to the store and they notice there's a lot of people there sort of preparing for more storms possibly and getting supplies for the, any power that went out and everything but in their own areas yeah. and there's while they're in the store there is this um and after this uh this mist blots out the sun there is a earthquake like oh, wow. jolt or, or a jump like a, a, a sound and a feeling um that goes through the whole area yeah that's that's um First, I think it's interesting to point out that uh, there's like a weird tension between um, the main character uh, Drayton. So he's played by Thomas Jane, who is play he he plays uh, the Punisher in the in, uh, one, in like the early 2000s Punisher movie, which is pretty cool. And then uh, Andre Brower plays the neighbor, and he just crushes it. He's so good in this, and he's in uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine. He's like hilarious. Um, but there's a weird tension between them. I guess like they're just not very neighborly and one of them sued the other one at one point, so they just really, really don't get along. Um, so there's yeah, like a big... It was, yeah. it was Brent that sued um, David Drayton yeah. over property line dispute. Oh, geez, and yeah. David won. And yeah. Brent Brent um, thinks it's because David is a local. Oh, yeah. And Brent is a summer person, as they call yeah. him. It says here, like, Brent's uh, a, big, a big city attorney, or whatever. It's a quote-unquote. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but like it's it's interesting that there's a like baked in tension that they're bringing into the supermarket already, and then yeah, um, the boom, like the boom thing, and the, or the rumble thing. I mean, um, I found that interesting because we don't know what really what that was. If that was just like creature, like monsters that like literal sounds on the roof or whatever. But um, in Lovecraft, there's and and then uh, a Dunwich Horror, which I, I must have mentioned this at some point during the course of our shows together, um, but it's like takes place at America Stonehenge and it's about this um this like one kind of weirdo um outcast who's like out in doing weird cattle mutilations and rituals up in these stone circles and the town discovers what he's doing because these um rituals causes like where he wants to open a portal to Lovecraftian old ones and bring Lovecraftian old ones um monsters whatever into this reality and he gets caught because doing that creates giant rumbles mysterious ominous rumbles that come from beneath and above and um that's what like allows a town to realize what he's doing so is that what we heard is it the rumble of um some kind of dimensional rift opening and um i don't know interesting yeah and i mean if you think about well we'll get to that there's there's <laughs> um yeah <clears throat> and we'll probably end up saying that here and there throughout the story yeah but, sure, but um sure. so so everything is getting dark outside. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. One more thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I put, put, put my notes um, that when the when the neighbors were first talking to kind of break the tension, they're like, "Oh yeah, um, I thought we were gonna like talking about the storm." Oh yeah, it was crazy. I thought we were gonna fly off to Oz, and uh, I found that interesting because Oz has like the 
um, or the Wizard of Oz has the tornado, but it's also it's a vortex portal connotations like to another world. So fly off to Oz, um, portals to another world kind of like connection there. Uh, and then on the drive to the store, they kind of foreshadow in the movie like um, a bunch of military tanks driving by. They're like, oh, what's up with that? Have you heard like, it's, but it's mysterious to the people in the town. They don't know what the, they like. Oh, I heard it's called Project Arrowhead. Um, they're like a military uh, research or like a missile missile defense research installation, um, but we don't really know what they're doing. So kind of set, like setting up the different elements that are going to be playing out. Yeah. Now that in the book, they don't even know. No one even knows what. Like there isn't even the mention of missile defense in there. Oh, yeah. It's like just even, no one even knows. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I like that. When I was reading some of the reviews, uh, it seemed like that the uh, movie kind of like like walked people through it maybe a little more than the book readers might have wanted. That like Stephen King kind of left it more to to the creative mind of the reader, and uh, like this kind of spelled it out a little bit. But like at one point, they're like, "Yeah, it's missile defense research," um, and then the like uh, Brent whatever jokes um, "Yeah, Mrs. Edna says that uh, there's a crash flying saucer and frozen alien bodies that they have up there." So there's all kind of conspiracies around there already from the town people. Yeah. The other thing, um, and again, this is going off memory again, is there's a central figure in the story that that you'll meet, even though you kind of meet her in memories that David has of um, conversations with his wife. Now, Stephanie, the wife, uh, there's this hobby shop in town. Um. And this is again, this is just David. Th- David thinking about all these things as everything's happening. Yeah. And um, and so Stephanie likes to go there and and take Billy, her, her son, with with them. And the owner of this shop is named Mrs. Carmody. Or Carmody. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. And she is, I want to say she, well, she's really into sort of end of the world. On a biblical, uh, in, in in the biblical frame of, of mind, sort of the end of the world and and into natural remedies, but David doesn't think much of her yeah. sort of thoughts, and she he thinks that she's controlling everyone that really visits her shop a lot uh, with all these ideas and oh, sort wow. of influencing them, and so you have these two. There's already again, there's already this built-in kind of tension even though david doesn't even know yeah. that she's there at first until they start walking around yeah and the, um so there's already this built-in tension and of course in normal circumstances mrs carmody that that doesn't really matter her, yeah. her sort of views on things don't really matter yeah exactly so but, like, at one point somebody yeah. um like one of the managers of the store like says for anybody for all you out-of-towners she's known as the crazy lady in town basically don't take her seriously um, but, uh, in the movie, she's like fit, extremely religious. It's all just like God fearing stuff. Um, just real, mm-hmm. re- it's strictly about the God stuff. And I guess in the in, in novella, it's more like, like you're saying more conspiracy theories, kind of folk, folk remedies and like kind of, uh, more just, um, yeah, she's just more kind of like the kooky, like lady at the, at the witch store. Type, like type of vibe is like yes oh, it's, yeah what it's what it seemed like but very yeah. much almost like a stereotypical thought or image of, of a witch yeah yeah not exactly. quite really the the you know the we i think we talked i talked about this before on uh, well actually uh, matt's owl talked about the real sort of the more realistic way people are when they're you know that they follow that um that kind of thinking that's nothing like what you see in in the the book or the movie Really. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But this, she still that name is still attached to her because of everything and because of popular culture. Yeah, and, um, and I think and I, yeah. I think like she's she's supposed to represent. We'll get into like more how like in detail, but I think she's supposed to represent how those ideas can be like used to influence people and warp people. And um, it's not the ideas that are bad, but but the ideas can be weaponized by by by, by different people and stuff. You know, to like to influence yeah. and gain power and sway people. Right. So, um, with this mist rolling in, at one point, there the power goes out, and also the generators stop working as well. Mm-hmm. And so, one of the employees, 
uh, let me see here, Norm, I think it is, um, wants to, uh, has to go out, goes to check, check on the generator. And, um, and then basically the, they, uh, they start really having this, noticing the smell coming from the back of the store. And David goes to check it out too. Um, after there's this, this, these sirens that go off and this mist and everything, uh, that's just surrounding the area. Yeah. And, um, so let's see here. So at one point, I, one I of think, them, yeah, go ahead. I, I think, I think in the movie, somebody had already like, who ends up being one of the main characters in the, in the story already comes in like running with blood on their head. There's something in the mist. There's something in the mist. So they're like already on edge, I think, but nobody really knows what's going on. Nobody's really like thinking supernatural or anything really yet. it's just kind of one guy in a creepy mist and then like they go up back and see the smell and everything i think i think it's the course in, in the movie but i'm not sure yeah in the um so in the book there's there's a few of the guys that go back into the back section of the store um where all the supplies all the the, the products come in and they realize that the generator is not working and so one of them norm volunteers to go outside to fix the vent and uh, he's dragged into the mist by giant tentacles. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So first, just like tentacles. Oh, yeah. Like this is ahead of the curve with the, with the whole tentacle boom, too. And the movie really like I was watching it with uh, subtitles on and they say tentacles like 10, like 10 times in a row. In it. And like when they're trying to explain, when they're trying to explain to people that it, what happened, yeah. they're like tentacles, tentacles. Tentacles? Yeah, tentacles. Crazy. And it's just insane. But but like I don't know. Like at, like at one point, one of the other store uh, clerks, uh, Ollie, was like, or like um, Drayton the whole time was like, "Don't go outside. What are you doing? We've been told there's something weird in the mist. Don't go out there." But Norm is like, just like he's, he's like a younger stock boy in the in the um, in the movie. So it's kind of like, no, 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 I can handle that. Like I can go out there. I'm not scared. Like shut up, mind your own business. And all the other guys are like, no, the kid wants to do it. And all these like, um, they can't handle what's going on out there. Like they don't know what's going on in the store. They can't. There's a huge problem. They can't wrap their head around it. But now we have a problem that we can fix with the generator. They can figure. They they can handle the generator. So they're just gonna figure it out. And like consequences be damned. And they're not thinking straight. And then, yeah. So he's like peeking out. I'm, it's uh. I have it on silent on mute. Like in the background right now. And we're at that part of the movie. And he's just like peeking out the door. He has like the um those big uh i forget i'm not i can't think of what what they are but like those big truck doors or whatever opened up uh, a little bit just up to his knees and he like turns around and laughs like oh no big deal and all of a sudden these disgusting sinister tentacles come in not just regular ones but tentacles that have like almost like sharp little rods and like pincers on on them like like sharp things all all along them like like n like not suction cups but just like pointy pointy things and it rips it rips your flesh off and it's really like Gross. I'm I'm not a gore guy. Uh so yeah, it's like, this is like right up, this is like right up to the edge of like what's tolerable for me. Um yeah. but it was like, oh man, this is this is crazy. Yeah. So um so yeah, they now after this happens, the the ones everyone goes back to the front. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um and to tell everyone what happened. And of course no one believes them including Norton. So this is already bringing that tension that was already there between David and Norton uh, uh, out in, into the open. And so Norton and several people um, go outside for help. Yeah. Um, there's, and there's a lot of conversation between a lot of the characters that I'm skipping here just because there's just, um, there's only, it, it doesn't really affect too much overall. Just yeah, more this, interpersonal relationships. Yeah. This, there's one um, point that uh, popped up later, so I figured you might as well mention it. But there's like one scene where um, one of the ladies from The Walking Dead, um, I forget her name, but if you're a Walking Dead fan, she's like one of the main characters. And she has a, like the really short hair. Um, uh, she, she's like freaking out because her kids, she like left her eight year old daughter to watch her younger sons. And like I only was supposed to leave for two minutes. Yeah, like, right down the street. I have to go. I have to go home. I have to go back. They're freaking. Like they would be freaking out without me. I can't stay here for all night long. Um, they're like, no, you can't leave. Don't leave. And then she goes, I have to. Like, is somebody gonna 
walk me home. Like somebody take me, like it's dangerous out there. Somebody please help. And she's just looking at everybody. She's like staring all of the main characters down and they're not making eye contact with her. Um, Drayton's like, sorry, I have a kid. I can't, I can't do it. And then, she, and then she just leaves into the mist to, we're not sure at that point what, what happens to her. Right. But and, like, it, and Mrs. Carmody at this point, this is when she starts to freak out a little bit. Yeah. And, 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 it's, yeah. and, 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 and like the, the, I think that's trying to say, it's trying to say that like society is already kind of breaking down. That yes, we, we we don't even really have. I'm not even sure. Like, there might even be before the tentacle. I'm I'm not, I'm not even positive. But there are already the slightest uh, hiccup with like normalcy. Or you're they're already like he's already grabbing his son real tight, and it's already like me like every man for himself already. Um, yeah. But, yeah, and also because of the power being out. The um the cashiers the people doing the the it's all manual, yeah. so that's already creating tension in the store. Yeah, and I love like so so this is just gonna get into when society breaks down, what happens. It's like, that's probably one of the core themes of the story. Yes, and just and just as a supermarket employee, I love and this doesn't this doesn't stay throughout the story, but I love it the very the very beginning. The managers and the supermarket clerks are at the, like. At and relatively close to the top of the hierarchy, you know, it's just like yeah, that would last for a while, and I just, I, I mean, not for, not for that long, but I'm like that would be very short lived little. Uh, yeah, we're in my building, so yeah, must listen to me, and that's gonna last for about five minutes until people freak out, so shut up, you know. Well, and then until one of them, uh, Ali, yeah, you know, knows what's been going on, and he's trying to tell everybody, no, like I saw this. Yeah, and exactly. you have I forget what the other guy's name is in the story. It's not super important, but the guy that's basically like a manager is in charge, and is, is just like, no, yeah, you're you're lying, you're mistaken, no. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, yes, yeah, so that's yeah. the thing. So, 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 so we have kind of three different factions here in the beginning. We have the ones who saw the tentacles. So everyone's freaked out. Everyone knows that there's a problem, and they're trapped in the building. But um, Drayton and the people and Ollie and the manager, or when oh, um. Ollie, not the manager, but like the um, t uh, mechanics guys um, who just saw the kid get ripped out. Norm, yeah. They know like Norm, yeah. Like they know there's monsters. The religious lady is saying, um, Mrs. Cormody, whatever she's saying, this is, this is uh, a message from God. Or this, is, this is the apocalypse. And then we have uh, Brent being like, what are you talking about? This is some weird natural disaster. Nothing supernatural about it. Um, shut up. Stop trying to scare people, both of you. Like Drayton, you're scaring people with tentacles. Cormody, whatever your name is, you're scaring people with with God. Just like shut up. This isn't supernatural. This is just normal weirdness. You know. Yep. And also around this time, people start. Well, that that's another point in the story too. Um, around the same time, people start um like trying to hoard groceries. Oh really? That's not in the movie. Oh, that's interesting. Oh yeah. Oh, wow. that and would happen instantly. The, yeah. yeah, as some of them are thinking of or, or considering trying to get out, or even just to have for themselves, and that manager is starting to freak out because he's seeing all this as, you know, it's it's the the store's property still. Yeah, yeah. and it, it, you know, no, sorry, and no, the, the the movie doesn't get into that uh, one iota. Which is when I was watching it, I was thinking like, this is going. I mean, it goes. It's this is a disaster. This is like a really, uh, I wouldn't want to be um, one of the people in the movie, obviously, but this goes pretty smoothly for how I think it would actually go in real life. Like, if we look, I don't want to mention any keywords, but if we look what happened a couple of years ago, I was working at the building. I went at the supermarket, like on March 12th, um, 2020, the store was full. On March 13th, 2020, I, I go in that night and the store is empty. Empty. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in there. It, they emptied out in one day just like because the, of the prospect of, of danger. Um, and it, yes, it was scary for everybody, but like this is giant tentacles ripping kids apart. Like they would be freaking out. Um, so I thought that would be interesting. Um, yeah. Like, I think it would go even worse, even, even more Lord of the Flies style if it happened in real life. But yeah, sorry. And, uh, and the other thing, the one of the areas that <laughs> is rated the fastest. <clears throat> Of course, is are the beer, the alcohol coolers? Oh yeah, sure, yeah. Because you know Drayton and Ali, and they've all seen this craziness, and so yeah. they go there, and you know. But yeah. 
Yeah. That's literally so, in the movie. Like, yeah. I'm on uh, I'm on mute right now, and literally uh, Ollie just has a Budweiser uh, going to his lips right now, and uh, right. <laughs> the manager, the uh, the uh, manager's like, uh, "What are you doing? I'm gonna I'm gonna write you up for drinking. What's what's everybody doing? Stop 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 taking food. Like this is still a building." And uh, the guy's like, "Hey, um, what do you name is manager? Like f you. Like shut up. This is yeah. the apocalypse. This is the apocalypse. We, like, you know, I don't know. It's crazy. I can, yeah. as, a, as a, it's really is like a surreal experience. Just think about everyone who's listening. Just like think about if the apocalypse happened at your office. You know, this, that's how it is for me right now. Watching this, right? So." Um, so yeah, at one point, uh, Norton, uh, Brent Norton and a group go out and they, they don't come back. I mean, that you hear them and, and they actually, I don't think it's this time. It's another time. I think it's someone else goes out after them. The, is, it, is that group? I forget. Oh no, it's this, it's, I think it's this time. It's oh, we're, the rope? Yeah, like, yeah, the rope. Yeah. So, so yeah. Drayton, Drayton, like as, so what's what's uh the neighbor's name brent brent yeah yeah so, oh, yeah. So, it's someone in his group that volunteers to take a rope out with them yeah in so the movie a, a lead for everyone to get out later on if they can yeah exactly exactly and like in, in, in the movie um so the divide is happening so brent he takes all the ones who they know something's bad but they don't they don't believe the tentacle thing um and the, the evidence is gone because like when they bring the man, like they, they bring Ollie brings the manager out to show him because he doesn't believe either at first, and they see, they, they see the piece of the tentacle and all the blood and everything, um, but then he pokes it with a stick, and after he pokes it, it dissolves in like black goo, uh, so the evidence is gone. So then Brent doesn't believe it because there's no evidence there anymore, and then he takes a, a, like one of the factions, like one of the three factions, to um, who don't think there's any religious thing happening or any supernatural thing happening, to go find help. Um, so Drayton's like, can you tie a rope to yourself so we know you're okay? We know how far you can get. And he's like, get out of here, no way. And then a bike, like a biker guy, uh, who's not part of that group, he's like, I don't, I'm not coming with you, but I want to go get the shotgun that this, that this guy has in his truck. So tie the rope to me. Um, so we'll find out how far we can get. It's like a 300 foot rope. So if I can get to the car, we know that like we can at least go 300 feet out of the building. Um, and then. If everything's going fine and then all of a sudden like the rope just that's going crazy it's burning drayton's hand trying to trying to hold it. it's getting pulled it's getting yanked like a like a like a fish like um and then it's like up in the ceiling it's like so we don't even know what's happening to this to this person and then they start to pull uh like the then it goes kind of limp and he's like frantically pulling it uh and they just see his the person's legs so the rope was tied around his waist and just from the waist down it's all that's left uh and Jeez Louise, crazy. No, and the, that's a little bit more gory than they do in the book. Oh actually. wow, really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the book, you just have the end of the rope. Oh wow! And there's no, no, blood no. on it. Oh no, no, no! You see the you see the whole waist down. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Well. Wow. Yep. Um. So. So everyone's trying to figure out what to do at this point after this group goes out, and meanwhile, Mrs. Carmody is just drawing more and more people over to her. Again, that sort of, I think it's a phrase that we've heard Mike use on, on, on his show before, on Trouble Minds, that cult of personality. Yes, yeah. That, yeah. that uh, the people are, are, people's minds are sort of breaking down because of what's going on, and they're looking for leaders, and they find one in her. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> before the, I just have a quote here in the notes. Um, when the biker ties the rope to himself and before he like leaves the building, he's like, uh, Hey, crazy lady. I believe in God too. I just don't think he's the blood thirsty, um, blank that you make him out to be. And she goes, mm. what, uh, well, you take that up with the devil when you run into him, you just chat it up over your, uh, over your leisure. So like she's, she's at the beginning, she's like, not just you people who don't believe in God are wrong and are going to get vengeance. It's the ones who think God is good. She's, she's, she's saying like, no, 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 like this, this whole passionate, forgiving God, this isn't, this isn't the real God. The God is a vengeful person who's going to smite you. And that's kind of the, the, the thing she's touting. Um, so the biker's like, no, like I I'm a religious person. I believe in God, but he's just not, he's not this evil person that you make him out to be. And she's like, all right, see you later. And then five minutes later, he's just legs. Now in the book, she is saying they all need to make, um, ask for forgiveness. 
oh, in, wow. through a ritual. And of course, it's a ritual sacrifice that she starts hinting at. Exactly. Same here. Yeah, same in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And she doesn't go right at it yet. Right yeah, at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. Yeah. But um, yeah, so now after this happens with this group that goes out and doesn't come back, um, this is where all the creatures start showing up. Yep. And swarming the store. This is also nighttime at this point. Yeah. Like, or at least it seems like nighttime. It's it's just really dark. Yeah. And I think it does get to be nighttime, like over the cor- over the course of that the afternoon. Yeah. I think it is night because she uh, she goes, um, tonight they will come and they will take somebody or they will kill somebody. Um, right. And then like the next day, I don't want to like. We're a little out of order, but it just it just happens when you're trying to summarize a, a movie. Yeah. Means is, um in a book, but like the next day, the way she gets more more followers is that somebody's like she said this is going to happen that they were going to come at night and they did. Mm-hmm. She said somebody's going to die yeah. and they did. So these little things of her just kind of kind of <clears throat> she's she's that's kind of one of the observations, like one of the I think messages is trying to say it's that like the religion isn't bad, but like it can be twisted and manipulated and um you can you can use different things but um belief, any, any belief system not just, right. not just christianity um, definitely yeah in, in order to to kind of corral scared people and that when people are scared they start just looking for any anything to alleviate that so or any any just type of answers it's like just grabbing for anything in the dark and she was like just like that's what these kind of apocalypse preachers do and i'm in the conspiracy game like uh, no stranger to hearing like the the gates of hell are gonna open that type of stuff and and if you treat it kind of I feel like how we all treat it as more just maybe juice style just um, more just uh, kind of stu- supernatural sci-fi stories and less like we're not in a supermarket getting attacked by monsters and everything so it's it's not it's not as serious but there are like tons of people in the game who do try to intentionally scare people and just yep. pick and choose, pick and choose different portions from from different scriptures of any religion, and and twist the message into so they're not lying per se, they're not changing the words, but they're selectively out of context, picking the scariest things and applying it to things that are happening. They so see like there's the look at the stingers on these bugs. These are the scorpions that will come that God, that, that that God said will come and spite us. Like look, oh wow, like making making connections, you know, which have, people have been doing. Um, since Nostradamus or forever, like just making parables, like right now is the apocalypse because look at look at this war, look at this um, flood, look at this thing. Like, this is what you know what I mean. Sorry, yeah. Long. yeah. No, it's okay. And you know, I think um, one thing the story doesn't really like the novel doesn't really um, sort of describe. But I'm wondering now about that because it was like closer to noon when they all got there. I'm wondering if there is some alteration of time with oh, everything. Wow because of how everything goes and how it becomes night. But yeah. yeah, at night all these creatures show up, these insects that co- that come onto the building. And one of them actually I think um starts to to get into a window. Yeah. And yeah, there's, um there's, there's, there's like a ton of like little like big like yeah. wasp waspy like big like the size of my like forearm almost like huge like and then almost like like almost like raptor sized things. Start to, like there's like hundreds of the little little wasp things not but like li- little little as in almost cat size and then there's right. like big like like raptor size flying things like um a couple dozen of them probably, that, that, calm too. Yeah, yeah that start to like yeah. uh smash into the window and one of them breaks a hole and then that's when that's they, they all start to get in so there's like one major hole but like the whole like the they're not all getting in but it's just enough right. to cause chaos. <clears throat> And they do, the people do, because be, before this happens, that they start to believe that there may be creatures out there, and they start to prepare, which is where the the broomsticks come in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, partly also for light as well. These uh, these broomsticks are doused in uh, gasoline, basically, yeah. or lighter fluid. I think it's lighter fluid. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's how they use, um, what they use at first to... Uh, to fend everything off. Yeah. In addition to one of the characters, uh, Amanda is her first name, has a gun, and that is given to Ali since he has experience using a gun. Yeah. And so they make so, it through that first night. Yeah. So, so, so uh, 
I don't want to keep uh, interrupting. Just uh, um, no good. But, um, Amanda, I think in the story, I think they, they, I think they cut this out for the movie completely. But in the story, wasn't she having an affair with Drayton? That's like one of the plot lines of the. Like, that's yeah. That's the odd know. thing in the story is she has she. I believe she has a husband, but of course she can't get to him. Yeah, and she knows that Drayton has a wife, and the way the story kind of. And the way Drayton sort of describes it is they're just, it's the whole situation that drives them to do that, to have that affair, which that's uh, like uh, a, a bit, I don't know about that. Oh, uh, so, so it happens like yeah. within this, like within the story. Uh, I yeah. thought it was like, um, I thought it was, they knew each other beforehand and they were like, she, no. was, she, was, she was cheating on his wife with her beforehand. Oh, uh, like that no. makes more sense. That makes more sense. Yeah. It's sort of a stress. Sort yeah. of they, they, they write it off as being, and then after that happens, they don't, it's not the same. They don't plan yeah. on doing that again in the story. Yeah. But um, but the thing that happens is this whole time, after they come back from, as they come back, they they find a manager's room, that's like secluded secluded a little ways from yeah. everyone else. But Mrs. Carmody sees them coming out of that room. Oh, uh, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> I can see why you would keep that out of the movie. Yeah. It just it, it makes them look like like he. It makes him look like a jerk. I mean, like you're it, in the middle of an yeah, apocalypse, and you cheat, you cheat on your wife. Your kids, your kids, like a hundred feet away from you at the, in a store, like with gun, with crying. It is with an Yeah. Yeah. Um. So and but as the story is going, the Drayton, uh, David, and some of the other people in the store, the store start thinking, we can't stay in here forever. Like, yes, there is all kinds of stuff out there. Oh. But oh, we oh. can't stay in there forever. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, at one point, this definitely wasn't in the wasn't in the in the book. Um, uh, one of those wasp things are, are on Mrs. Carmody uh, and crawls up crawls up her like chest and then like goes right in front of her face. Flies like right in front of her, is like hovering at her, staring at her face. Um, wow! Yeah. And this, is this is immediately after one of the like the checkout girls. Um, got stung and just died immediately. So these things, we know these these things are dangerous. Like she, she got stung in the neck and her neck like, burnt, like really blew up. And uh, so these things are, will kill you. So everyone sees this wasp hover in front of her face, and she's like, and she prays to God, like I am your servant, like blah blah blah. And then the wasp flies away, and she's spared. So that like, um, mm. that makes people think that she really is this like person chosen from God, or who really is this wow. person, you know. That is odd. Yeah. Very weird. Very weird to put in the movie. They yeah. added that in there because that is not yeah. in the book. Like yeah, she does get kind of batted around at certain places and knocked over and things, but she's not. Yeah. Huh. Very, very um, weird. Yeah. So now there is one little expedition that David goes out with. And what they do is they try to go to the pharmacy next door. Mm -hmm. And and they they to get some medical supplies and yeah, somebody got burned yeah there's like a guy got, got lit on fire because they were trying to they're trying to burn those yeah. plugs and somebody and somebody got lit on fire and they need to get like painkillers and uh, antibiotics or he's gonna die right <clears throat> and um and so they go there with some people um and they they get attacked by these spider-like creatures yeah and they have webs and the webs also burn when they yeah. land on people this is absolutely horrifying like I'm not yeah. not a, I'm not a spider guy, you know. I, I I believe like all animals have souls and that type of stuff, and they're probably not evil per se, but they are just absolutely terrifying to me. And just the yeah. idea, that, like if the, if they were big, they would <laughs> like any they would they would web you up and keep you alive and slowly eat on you while you're alive, you know. So call that evil or not, but like it's definitely scary. Um, and this yeah, this is a really freaky scene. And just one of the one of the um, there's a soldier that they see like webbed up who's still alive. He's like, help me, help me! And he, there's like all kind of like he's like there's all boils and stuff. And he's kind of bubbling up, and there's like little spiders kind of poking out of his skin. And then he like like bursting out of his, his skin. And then he falls over and kind of just disintegrates. Like his whole midsection kind of explodes, and just like ah. a, million, a, a million spiders just pour out of him. It is just they, the worst. They it's don't the worst. do that in the story. Oh, it's so know. gross! It's so gross! Yeah. yeah. So they really go for that, and so but no, in the start, no, they do see people that are wound up. Yeah, 
Um, but nothing really happens like that. But that's yeah. how they also realize that they're dealing probably with spiders. Yeah. Um, and so they they get they get back. But you know that that that's, I'm glad you mentioned the military guy. Yeah. Because the other thing that happens in the story, and this happens a little ways back, and I forgot about it, and the summary doesn't mention it right away, or really at all, is yeah. in the story there are these three people that are obviously soldiers. Yeah. In the store. And they're there when everything is starting, but then no one sees them for a while. And yeah. so David and everyone goes, a couple of people go back to the back of the store again, and turns out they had killed themselves. Yeah, exactly. So, and so the implication is that it's because they knew something about that Arrowhead project. Exactly. exactly. And about what was happening. Yeah, really dark, and so so uh, in this like they're um, you know the, the three soldiers and they kind of tucked away separately, kind of huddled together, which is really really weird because everyone else is kind of all hand, all hands on deck. People they're piling up dog food and fertil fertilizer in front of the window to kind of secure it. Right. And these three soldiers who were just like sitting there, they 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 should be the ones who were taking charge. Like this, the ones people turn to, who were at least the most physically fit of the group. Um, and they're they're not, they're not helping at all. So at one point they're like, "Hey guys, uh, and you guys want to help move dog food around? Like help help us out here." So I'm like, "Oh yeah, okay, okay." And then one of them is like more of a, of a main character in the story. Um, uh, he like he's a he's relatively he's like a kind of a hot actor right now. He's the I think he's the voice of one of the characters in the Star Wars video games that just came out. So he's like having a, mm -hmm. like a big, he's huge with he's bigger Star Wars fans, and he's the voice of uh. Darth Maul in the newest movies and in the animated stuff, but he has a relationship, or he's like has a friendship flirtation with the with a checkout girl, and then they have like a little kissing scene or whatever. Like, no, nah, no, nah, we should. I don't want um, like this moment to be under these circumstances. And then as soon as that happens, she gets stung uh, and dies, and he tries to save her, and he's mm -hmm. real freaked out. And then, um, yeah, then he like he goes with them. He's like the only like not now he's in the story. He's helping them out completely. He's like with them when they go to the pharmacy and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the soldier that they see all webbed up in the in the pharmacy, he goes, "Help me, help me! It was my, it was our fault. It was Damn. our fault." Wow. And, yeah. So, and then so the soldier that went with them to the pharmacy, I guess. Um, so yeah. So then like like probably twenty minutes happens, and then they go. Where are the soldiers? What's going on? Let's find. Let's find. Let's find the soldiers. They find the one that they had have been with the whole time. They're like, "This is your fault. You did this." Project, like, what, what was mm -hmm. that soldier like, so, saying in the pharmacy? He's like, "I don't know. I don't know. I don't know." He's like, "Take us to the other two. Where are the other two? He's like, "I don't know where they are." So like, like, and then like you were saying, they go and they find them, and they're you just see their legs. They're 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 they they, they, hung, they hung themselves. And he goes, "Oh my god! I didn't know they would do it. I didn't know they would do it." Like when we came back from the pharmacy, I told them what what the guy said, like that it was our fault, and then they said they were going to do it, and that, then that, that's when they get into the um, Project Arrowhead stuff. Um, yeah. Wow. Do you want me to keep going on that real quick? Like, just, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think this is in the in the like story. I think that like the, the 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 details of Project Arrowhead, but then this is, this is when he explains. Um, he's like on his knees in front of Mr. Cormody and all of them. They're like. Uh, um, or like one of the one of the mechanics who was in the pharmacy and saw all the like the, all the spiders and everything. When they come back, he gets real freaked out. So he turns to the, the, the religious side and starts repenting and stuff. He, he just becomes mm -hmm. a fanatic. Um, so he sees them all go and try to find the soldiers in the back room. And he follows them and he hears like the "it's our fault" part. So he like drags him out in front of all the religious people and everybody else in the store. And he's like, like, it's you, you guys did this. He brought this to us. And then Miss Cormody comes up like front and center. He's on like his knees in front of her. He's like, no, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. What happened? And, uh, he, he he's like, um, yeah, like, I don't know. Like, I just worked there. I was just stationed there, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Like there were, there were rumors. Like we all, it's just from memory. Like, they're, like we all heard rumors. Yeah. Um, we all heard that, that they were, they, they, uh, knew about other dimensions. They knew there were other dimensions all around us. And they tried to make a connection. They tried to uh, make a window. And Mrs. Cormody goes, well, your window, looks like, looks like your window became a door. And he's like, well, it's not my, not my door, not my door. 
And then, yeah, I vaguely remember that now. It was a few yeah. months back when I, I listened to this that movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it's like a really cool, that's a lot cool line. And I've, I've used that a lot when we're talking about portals and Titans and that kind of <laughs> stuff. But, but like the idea that like they, tried, they tried to make a window and then the window became a door and they let, they let these things in. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, real quick on that, on the arrowhead aspect. Um, I won't go into this whole thing, but like um, recently we talked about, I forget like what the general show topic was. Like, I think it might have been the, the lake one where we're talking about the uh, portal idea and we're getting into like the, the river portal aspect. And I'm talking about yeah. like the um, idea that like the long story short, there's like a, a grid that like somebody made on Google Earth that you use the prime meridians as like allocated um the path of the sun the ecliptic and then the seven major river deltas on the planet and that's that grid has like all the major sacred sites all the weird sites all like the um area 51 type technological type sites everything anomalous is on this grid so i'm like oh wow this is some kind of weird portal grid and then a couple of years later um uh space force unveils their their logo and it's the prime meridians the ecliptic and the delta symbol or the arrowhead symbol so and that's like that's where i get the it's it's the secret this these secret programs it's probably less star trek and it's probably more stargate or it's probably more messing with portals and other dimensions and, and that type, like trying to open windows and open doors and it's like in, interestingly they use the vector symbol delta symbol and then which is which is the arrowhead symbol and then in this is project arrowhead that's opening doors and opening windows and it's like i don't think stephen king is like privy to that long rambling nonsense of a conspiracy theory but it's weird that, 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 that that's like some kind of synchronistic thing that you know how, like how does that happen yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. also I mean, if you think about it what's that new ufo group in the government now oh yeah arrow <laughs> arrow <laughs> yeah exactly that's exactly it yeah wow wow i didn't even think about that wow i didn't either until just now <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow wow yeah so, but, yeah, so um, then, so then yeah. um i don't think this is in the story so just uh real quick and then yeah so after this moment where he's like it wasn't me like it wasn't my door i'm just i just worked there then um that's when she's like okay like it's no this isn't look like look like she is the majority of people are are turned to her side mm -hmm. she gets them all in a real frenzy and then like it looks like the store butcher like the like the, the supermarket butcher stabs the soldier a bunch of times and it's real weird like he kind of does it once and kind of like whoa i stabbed somebody and then just like starts really stabbing him and then they go uh he's still alive and they go like give them give him to the beast let the beast smell him and he's like the, then they like throw him out of the store he's trying to get back in and then wow. this, this, this giant like the first time you see one like a, a silhouette of one of the huge 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 ones um pulls him and just kind of yanks him and he's gone like he's uh and then She's, she's like the beast will leave us alone tonight but tomorrow we'll see you know and, and then it kind of fades out and goes to the next scene but crazy stuff yeah it is that is crazy so huh yeah they really added <laughs> scenes there to that that story that, that, but you, that but, movie but you can see how this it is works. like you know it, it, it's it, it, I mean, it definitely fits the fits the movie but i mean you can see how this is a microcosm of just like that is how ritual sacrifice and stuff would happen. That's a practical way that right. it would happen, you know? So it's like, yeah, um, it makes sense that cultures would do it, you know? Yeah. Like no, history. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. No, no problem. Yeah, no, but, um, so yeah, this, so this operate, this, uh, little trip out to that pharmacy does not go well, obviously. Yeah. But, um, and Mrs. Carmody is leading sort of hinting at that in the story as well. Look, we need to do this sacrifice. There needs to be a sacrifice of of a person, yeah. And so, and David and everyone that's not with that group starts to see how it's going to go if they don't get out of there soon. Yeah. And uh, so they start planning for it. Yeah. Kind of. uh, um, I, like so, it's it's kind of in the movie. It's kind of Ollie and Drayton and mm -hmm. Amanda. Like Ollie's like the not manager, but like the the capable clerk. And then right. Um, with one of the other main characters who like who came in the beginning, uh, so like I mean, it's like no, we can't. What do you mean? Like that? Like they're freaked out because like they're realizing the religious people. She's gonna turn them. Like they're this has been like two days, and they are they just 
stabbed and killed this soldier. Um, and then it's going to get bad. How long is it before they turn on you or they try to take my kid? And it, like, like, and she's like, uh, um, sorry, I have the quote here. She's like, uh, what do you mean? No, but like, people are basically good, decent. Like, my God, David, like we're, we're a civilized society. And David goes, sure. As long as the machines are working and you can dial 911, but you take those things away, you throw people in the dark, you scare the blank out of them. No more rules. Then all he goes, uh, as a species, we're fundamentally insane. Put more than two of us in a room, we pick sides and start dreaming of reasons to kill one another. Uh, why do you think we invented politics and religion? It's just like, geez. wow, yeah, <laughs> yeah, huh, yep, yeah. So they start planning, and Ali actually puts it together a couple bags of groceries and puts them in the checkout lanes near the ends, so that, that when they do make their move, they can just go. Yeah. And they start to do that. They start to make their move to leave. And they're spotted. Mrs. Carmody sees them. And, and tells the, the, gets the whole group together and has them surrounded and stopped. Yeah. And she, she, she knocks the bags out of the, the, the um, checkout lanes. And um, she's basically like, you're going to bring everything down on us. And... This is not part of, you know, how this has to go. There's supposed to be sacrifice. Yeah. And then she says, and the first one to go is going to be, and talking to David, is going to be your son. <laughs> yeah. Wrong move, lady. And like, <laughs> in, the, in the movie, um, this actress, uh, I mean, I think it's worth, it's worth a shout out. Um, whatever. She, but she absolutely crushes it. She's super over the top. Uh, Marsha Gay Harden. Uh, she was in like the movie Flubber back in the day, Robin Williams. Uh, but she absolutely just crushed at this movie and like way over the top and it was really great. And she's so, so she's walking around, um, like, before, like as they're sneaking out before she notices them. She's fully at the peak of her powers. Most of, most of the store, besides like the six or eight of them who were trying to sneak out, are completely on her side. And the way they have it in the movie, she's like walking around with, um, like a, like an old style. Um, milk jug, like a like a like a milkman style glass milk bottle, whatever. Just like chugging milk, and I was just like, "What a weird, quirky touch that she just like like mm. just drunk drunk on power, just sipping milk like a weirdo walking around the store talking about talking about I'm the vessel, I am the vessel." You know, she kept she kept saying, and then uh, yeah, I'll let you go ahead. But I just found that yeah. was a weird, 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 funny quirk. Just the milk thing. That is weird. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. So Ali and everyone tells, you know, her and everyone to get out of the way and they refuse. And uh and then Mrs. Carmody uh says, Take Amanda as well. Because basically I know what you two did. I saw what you and you know she's oh, wow. she's she's you know she she slept with that married man kind of thing. Yeah. And um and so the people start to do that. They start to move forward to capture uh, Amanda and Billy. So Ollie steps forward and shoots Mrs. Carmody. Yeah, yeah. And so you and have this sort of this figurative and literal removing of the 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 source of the power in this group. Yeah. Like in, in, in she's like she's lying down in like a like a cross position on the ground um, in the movie, which is just an odd, very odd touch. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's, and then as soon as, uh, I shall let you keep going. I don't want to spoil that. But yeah, it's just, it's just, it's really weird. Well, and the people are, uh, start to come out of it a little bit, but they're still so confused that they just stand around and start looking at each other. Like what's going on here? Yeah. And that's when Drayton, David Drayton and his group, they're like, that's it. We got to get out of here. Yeah. Exactly. Because not everyone in this group that, that Car Mrs. Carmody was leading, some of them are angry. A lot of them are angry. Yeah. That their leader has been killed by these people. And so Ali <laughs> has to hold the gun pointed at it back in the store as they're leaving until they get out of there. Yeah. It's like when I was when I was watching it uh, a couple hours ago, but before the show, I was like during this part, um, 
I was kind of thinking like, yes, like in the, in this story from the perspective of the main characters and like the protagonists of the story, the religious people and the masses are like in a store are the, they're crazy and they're the bad, the bad guys. But if you're in this story and you're like one of these random people in the store and there's tentacles and giant bugs and weird, this terrible eldritch horrors like coming at you and killing people. And this lady here is saying like, God will save you and is predicting everything and se seemingly before it happens and had this bug come stare her in the face and then not kill her. You might like listen to her and think maybe she's right, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and then there you have a, like a small group of like six people kind of walking around in the shadows and making plots and plans and like yeah. looking and looking down on everyone being like the, the bunch of idiots and the masses, like we, we, we gotta get out of here. I'm like, if that's the real world, they're like the Illuminati. A bunch of like weird like mm -hmm. creeps who are making plots and think of the rest of the people are stupid and don't believe in their beliefs and like let's let's get out of it let's go to mars or whatever let's go like and just yeah. uh, i don't know it's a fact about that like, i don't know what the movie is trying to say like in that in that regard and just all the weird religious stuff and her lying down like she's this kind of messiah type figure after she's killed is is weird you know and then we'll keep there's more points to that that we'll kind of like really make it ambiguous as, as we as we keep going but just that like it's a very ambiguous complex story in a cool way i think yeah now um so the group leaves the store david and ali and the rest of the group their little group it's like eight of them i think total yeah they leave the store to go to i think it was david's van uh their jeep or whatever it is i think it's like a van yeah and but as they're going to the van a couple of the people from the group get pulled back by monsters. Yeah. So, so that's what I mean. So the first person killed, like in a matter of a minute, less than a minute after he just shoots um, a Scormity is Ollie. He's the first one. Yes. He's, immediately, he's immediately snatched away. The so most like, capable one of yeah. the group, technically. In, in, in the one. hero. Like yes. earlier, er, he's, he's like, he's, he's, um, I think Ivan, Ivan Zola in um captain america he like works for the red skull in captain ah. america um but in this he's like a sympathetic character he's like he's not the manager but he's clearly like the most capable in the store he's not he's not um drayton but he's like basically like one of the main protagonists and he gets this right. like he gets the the gun beginning he's underestimated like what well, you can't shoot and he's just like every shot he takes he's just nailing it right away you know yeah he, he, he saves the kid at one point um from being attacked by the monster in the movie so he's like the good guy, one of the good guys of the movie, um, as you're supposed to believe in the movie. But then he right. kills, he kills Mrs. Cormody, and he's immediately destroyed by the beast, the monster. So it's like, is he was he being is he punished? Did God punish him for for killing it? Like, well, what's I mean, the he feels bad too when after he kills Mrs. Cormody, even though he knows they were gonna be, you know, yeah. he 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 says like I had to do it. I think he says that in the story in the book. Like he tells David, like I had to do it. You know that, right? And David's yeah. like, "Yeah, yeah." Uh, I did. In the in, in the movie, uh, he just like, "I killed her. I killed her." Yeah. I, he's like, "I killed her," and not he wasn't. He didn't feel bad. He he does kind of seem like, shocked, like a little bit shell shocked that he just took a life. And it's yeah, and that's like probably a moment, but it wasn't really remorseful. And immediately Drayton's like, "I know. Thank you. Thank you." It's like, it's, yeah. It's like from the story's from the movie's perspective, he did the he did the right thing, but yeah. then he immediately. Is killed. He's the first one killed by the monster when they leave the store. So it's yeah. like, what's what's Darabont trying to say? Because that's not in, that's not in the Stephen King story. But that's like, what's the movie? Is the movie trying to say that this is the wrath of God and he is being punished? Like, what's the deal? And there's even more things that will that will tie into that later on in the story. But just like, yeah, because I don't think he is the first one out killed. And and when they get to the, I think they get to the van and are starting to get in before he's actually taken. Yeah, no. In the movie, he's immediately. Sna it's like it's like wow. less than two less than two minutes. Like as soon as I like leave the doors, it's like and he's snatched away, and we don't see what happens, but you hear like the squishing and stuff. Right, immediately, yeah. crazy. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So and then one person um, makes it back to the store. So you have to wonder then, what happens with the rest of that group? Does that one person, you know, how do, how are how are they welcomed? If they are even welcomed back into the store, exactly by I the mean, people. We, um, we like in the movie we see, uh, 
so like it ends up um a couple of them get killed like, like, like you said and so it, in the car it's just drayton amanda drayton's son um the teacher lady who's kind of mm-hmm. like the lo- like the level-headed one who throws a can of peas at the at Miss Cormody at one point during the movie and uh, she's like the she's um one of the mechanics teachers who kind of like is the voice of reason um right. and then uh the, the, one of the older guys who's the first one to, who's like there's something in the mist originally who yeah. who had the who had the gun originally it's kind of like the core team of rational rational minds um and they're kind of all you see is just their headlights and all of the people in the store like looking out the glass kind mm-hmm. of watching them all roll away and the movie tries to make you think or alludes to them like okay these people are scared um and they're trapped in their fear and they're going to die in the store now from all these monsters and th- th- our heroes have, like they might die but they have a, they have a shot of now making it it's kind of what you're what you're led to believe and then and then here we go so yeah so they they get out of there they get into the van and they're they're able to leave the area but they have to be careful because this is the part now this goes back to the the quake or the rumbling okay in the beginning of the story there the the whole area the the cement there are just giant cracks in oh, the wow. cement like everywhere and even parts where the whole like Parts of the ground have fallen into just nothing, like voids. Oh wow! Yeah, well, that would have been cool. That would have been cool in the movie. Um, yeah, yeah, they didn't do that. It was just, it's like kind of. There's a lot of 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 mist, obviously, but then uh, right. I think there's like kind of like a white substance, seemingly, um, mm. kind of c- covering everything, like the trees and the ground. It almost looks like a like a other volcano with all the, all the volcanic ash. But I think there's like mm. a mix, a mix okay. of web, like a mix of web and soot, and I. Um, cause he, he sees on one time, uh, as a driving, like he sees his wife, uh, at like, they, they, they you see like the Drayton mailbox and then all of a sudden you see his wife and he starts to cry. Like I was supposed to fix that window, blah, blah, blah. Um, but she's kind of blended in, covered in webs oh, with all the, with all the rest of the white stuff. So, so I don't know what's, I don't know what's, what's like Miss Goo and what's web, but just everything yeah. is like white, you know? Now in the book, they, they do go to, uh, Drayton's property. But they can't even get in oh, geez. because yeah. there's a giant tree in the middle, right in front of the driveway, and oh. just mist right beyond. And they know they'd have to go on foot, and if they go on foot, they're dead. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So no. they have to. Leave, he has to leave her behind, not even knowing if she survived. Which really, you have to think she probably, probably didn't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. She was outside when they left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, um, exactly. exactly. And it's, it kind of just. They didn't even leave the car. They just drove by. He starts to yeah. cry. I mean, it just goes, "Oh, I'm so sorry." And then they just kind of, kind of keep driving, keep, kind of keep, keep, keep driving. But it's more yeah. just like the one more thing, like the, the main character is losing. Just the, kind of just, just like, yep. He, like, like, not only is this monsters around the store, but we're driving. We're seeing that the whole town is destroyed. It's weird. There's stuff everywhere. Um, like I'm at my house. My house is destroyed. My wife is dead. Um, and just things are adding up. Um, but yeah, go ahead. So now here's where talk about lovecraft there's they're driving away from the town and they and again they have to like be constantly slowing down to drive over cracks and they're they're seeing and hearing things moving all around them and um at one point they stop because david has this idea that what what the creatures are all drawn to isn't seeing the people it's the, the their, it's their sense of smell it's, these creatures are somehow even though they're from this other dimension they are physical in a way yeah. and they smell people and that's what draws them and so he actually gets out of the car for a minute to test this oh, and of wow. course as soon as he does he starts hearing sounds coming towards him but then when he closes the door you know the sounds stop oh, wow. but but um, anyway, this other thing now, they're driving along this road and they start, there's, the ground starts to shake again, shake again, but there's these, it's like giant footsteps. Yeah. And this giant creature, they can't even see the top of it. It's so tall. Yeah. Just these giant legs, <laughs> monstrous <laughs> legs, yeah. move across the highway and step right over them, 
over the car. Okay. And they leave these craters in the road where they have to they have to drive around these things. Yeah. That it's so big that they they, they can't even see the whole thing. So uh-huh. here you have like almost this Cthulhu esque, you know, yeah. creature that's just roaming the planet now. Yeah, it's so crazy. That's so cool. Yeah. Um and and yeah, it's it's a uh, in the movie it's it looks like a some weird giant bug insect absolutely massive hugely massive and they're, they're like underneath okay. it um they they do kind of show you the whole thing though i think okay. um which i think it might have been cooler though if they just made it just yeah. legs and let these giant dents because it, it wasn't it wasn't even that big in the movie i don't think um oh no this thing is huge just yeah yeah like if, if their car fell into the the one of the holes they'd be you know dead yeah dead. i wish i wish this is more kind of like uh Godzilla size, and and mm-hmm. there's like, uh, but it's walking on, walking on all fours. But it's just like it's covered in tentacles. It, it doesn't have like octopus tentacles, but it has like almost feeler feeler size tentacles, kind of all over mm-hmm. its like undercarriage or whatever. Um, wow, it's just like really bizarre. And they they're all, they're all just staring at it. I don't even think they say anything. They just look at it. It walks away. They look at each other, and they just kind of keep driving. Like this, I don't know. Cool. Yeah. So, and the story ends with with uh david drayton who is telling this whole story um he's they're in this hotel that they found that they were able they were able to stop at Mm -hmm. and that's where he's writing the story and everything and and so he's still awake even though everyone else has already passed out because of everything that's happened to him he's he can't sleep and he i'm guessing he probably wanted you know stay listen be be guard or whatever but he finds a radio, like a, a, what do you call it? Just a radio that, um, that works. It has like batteries and everything. And he searches the radio bands. And even though there's a ton of interference, and again, it's coming from the mist. So there you have this energy that's flowing throughout this whole area now. Oh, wow. Doesn't, no one even knows. They don't even know how far out, what, what size, what is the area or the size of the area that has been affected. It could just be part of New England, but for all they know, it could be the world. They have no idea. Yeah. But they, he says he thinks he hears someone say Hartford, which is another area, another town. Yeah. Um, just briefly, I'm one of the radio bands. And so that's where they're going to head to next. And, but again, they have no idea. And he doesn't even know if he heard it right. Yeah, but that's where that's where the story ends. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, that's a big difference from the movie. Um, I, I was shout out to the AV Club dot uh, com. There's a I was looking at the differences and it, it says um, the last line is uh, I'm going. This is from Drayton. I'm going to bed now, um, but first I'm going to kiss my son and whisper two words in his ear um, against the dreams that may come. Uh, you know, two words that sound a bit alike. One of them is Harford, the other is Hope. And he kind of goes into like, yeah, he, he was kind of criticizing that as a viewer or whatever, um, or as a, as a reader. But uh, Harford is, I'm assuming they're meaning Harvard, Connecticut, which is a uh, probably probably a little while away, while away, but um, just far enough where like maybe maybe there's a maybe there's, good, there's you know, all these kind of post apocalypse disaster movies. It's always maybe the West Coast is good, maybe the, maybe the East Coast right. is good, like, and um, so, but yeah, so for the big change, um. This is why I asked you in the beginning if you had, if you had seen it because I was interested in your reaction to this. Or if you don't, I'm glad, I, I'm glad I forgot because now yeah. I'm curious. So they're it's they're they keep driving. It's just like endless kind of just whiteness, just like um, post volcano soot everywhere, uh, seemingly. And then they run out of gas, um, or just the car like hiccups and stops. And he looks at the, looks at the gas tank and it's empty. And it's just as a I mean as a driver like you don't all of a sudden realize you're out of gas. Like, you know, that thing is close to E for, no. a, long, for a long time. I yeah. Mean, but, but it's a movie, whatever. Um, right. So they're, they're out of the gas. And then um, I think they're like hearing rumbles and stuff. And it's just like, they're going to die. Like until, Unless they get into some kind of shelter or something. Like they're going to die. They can't leave. Like they're realizing like, this is it for them. Um, like the kid is asleep. They're all kind of like looking at each other. And then they pick the gun up. And like I'm not sure the exact word or whatever, but they realize that there's five of them in the in the vehicle, but there's only four bullets. And Drayton's like, um, "I'll figure something out." I'm implying 
he's gonna he's gonna shoot everybody um, to put them out of their misery, and then he'll figure out a way to to die himself. So I think he so the kid is like sleeping on Amanda's lap, and I'm assuming he shoots him first to kind of spare him of um, any fear, uh, obviously. Yeah. So, but there's but you just you're zoomed out of the car, and then you just kind of maybe see flashes, but we just kind of you hear the gunshots like, and then quick kind of quick ones, and then. He's just like screaming and crying, just like you can't okay. imagine the, yeah. the, pain, the pain of that. And then he gets out of the car, or he like tries to shoot himself a bunch of times, just frantically. Just he knows there's no bullet in there, but he's just like really freaking. Like, you can only imagine what what he's yeah. going through. And then he gets out of his car and tries to basically like antagonize the monster. Come here, come get me, like put me out of misery, like type of deal. Come on, but nothing comes. But then I think he hears rumbling or something, and all of a sudden. You just see a convoy, just a massive um, infantry of soldiers start to walk down, tanks and oh uh, yes. cars, and just I all, all, all on foot. And he's just looking all around, and they just—they're saved. The day is saved. Like they're burning, they're burning all like the web and everything that's all around the town, and they're like sh- shooting these monsters and stuff. And they're here to rescue everybody. Um, and you see, like on the on a big truck, there's just like a hundred different people that they that they saved, and one of them is like the lady from The Walking Dead. Uh, who left the store in the beginning that nobody would would come with? She wanted to go get her kids. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody assumed that she just died. You know, she was like, safe and sound, like with her kids in the truck. Um, and he's just staring there, like, "Oh my god!" And he starts just screaming, like, "What did I just do? If I waited, if we waited less than a minute, we, we would have been saved." And I just shot my son. Um, and the movie ends like that. Mm. It's he, ridiculous. He it is because he. Yeah. In the book, he did mention he had the gun and that there were only, you know, that many bullets left. Yeah. And but he he mentioned he was saving that as a last resort. Yeah, they used it. Yeah. So yeah, it's like they extended. Wow, that's odd. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. And I'm pretty sure based, 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 based on a based on a little, uh, like just tangential research, like it seems pretty controversial. Like I'm not sure how book readers feel about it and even movie fans i'm not sure how they feel about yeah. it it's like a it you can't you don't get much more somber than that um, yeah no i remember I, I remember that now and i i do remember i didn't like it and i was just yeah. like come on yeah yeah it's tough you, you don't want to leave the so i think like i'm not sure i think the first time i watched it i was probably like that, that sucks um not not in like a that's poorly written but kind of just really want to you know, leave us like that yeah but then i think i think the um this past time watching it it seemed more like it kind of fits the story. Like it's, this is like, right. like this is a helpless thing. Like, like when I talk about like, um, you know, this isn't the, um, like with the, with the pandemic stuff, whatever, I'm, I'm sick and tired of hearing people talk about it. I'm like, this isn't the apocalypse that I want. Give me the, give me the Cthulhu coming or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like when I say that, I just mean like a quick, like stop out and we're done. I don't mean giant spiders coming and laying eggs in my body and stuff. That's not what I want. Like this movie is like, scary and really, uh, and obviously, when I say like what I want, I mean that's completely a joke. <laughs> obviously, like yeah, but just like like this movie is somber, and this movie is like hell, like devastating, and just the scariest part is like the web part, and just like when when these monsters get you, you don't die. Like you're kept alive by these things, and it's right. It's absolutely terrifying in this movie, and everyone dies, and like the heroes die, and it's just it's devastating. So to that, it does kind of like fit the ending, but also just. Like, <laughs> If I'm in the theater, I walk out of the theater, I'm bummed out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, like, what's it saying? What is it saying? Like, so you're assuming now that they're going to the store. And they're going to save the people. They're going to save the religious people. So mm-hmm. what, you know what I mean? And then, like, yeah. and so she's laying down, her dead body's laying down, like, on, like, in the side of the cross on the ground. Like, she's, like, the, she, like, died for everyone's sins, basically, and now she's going to be saved. And it's just, what, what a bizarre thing. And it, like, um, uh, like one of the um, my movie podcasts, I was like, I went back in the archives, and they were talking about the mist. And I listened like the first like ten minutes or whatever, um, right before right before this. And they're like, they're they're like, uh, I think in which I haven't seen these movies, but I think in Children of the Corn, there's a weird religious fanatic, and they're like, and in uh, Harry's mom is kind of a weird religious fanatic, and they were like pointing out that Stephen King um, puts these type of people in his his books a lot, whatever, but like kind of as a, I don't even know what his religious beliefs are. Um, he's from my area. So I can, I can assume that 
he was raised religious and probably rejected it to a slight degree. That's, that's just right. that's like, that's that era. Um, like raised Catholic and kind of went against it. Um, but this movie is that's not what it's saying. It's like the religious people were the yeah. villains of the movie, but then they win. They're like the, what they said ended up being turning out to be right. So it's just a weird, ambiguous, um, moral of the story. I don't, I really don't know. I'd be interested to see what Darabont would say, said, said about it. You know? Yeah. Well, th- yeah, so that basically covers it. Although I did want to ask you how you would go about sort of the defense of a grocery store oh, in man. a similar situation. I wanted to see yeah. your thoughts on just <laughs> oh, what you would do in, in a real world version of any of this. Yeah, uh, I don't want to give away too many secrets because in the, like, the, the, the day that it might happen, I, I don't want people to be able to plot against me. Uh, uh, come on, Derek, <laughs> come on. No, no, you got to spill but, it all. No, I'm yeah. just kidding. But no, but first you gotta like if I'm you gotta take care of that glass first. If there's some type mm. of weird, weird mist that's like seeping like seeping through and that's at the mist is the danger. Like my first instinct is like the monsters go with the mist. So I'm blocking any cracks in anything, like any vents or it like there's no mist getting in, let let alone let alone monsters. Um so if I'm or let alone like wasps that are clinging to the window, like I'm putting there's so much cardboard in the store, like I'm basically putting like a foot worth of cardboard on every window like it's going to take a one of those raptors to bust in intentionally it's not going to be some type of accidental thing because they're attracted they're attracted to the light of the building you know um, right yeah and then i'm just not hanging you don't hang out in the middle of the store you know like if you <laughs> like you're these things you have to plan that these things are probably going to get in so there's like maintenance rooms furnace rooms attic like places that are behind like the HVAC room and stuff, places that are behind huge double doors and huge, like huge, thick, heavy doors that uh, our Cthulhu will bust down easily, but can at least protect you from spiders and wasps and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, but, but I think based on just the reviews I was reading, reading, like I think the story gets more into like, um, like the monsters are, the problem in the movies because more like the monsters are like a plot device but the people are the problem i mean so mm-hmm. like so if so we're dealing with people here that's kind of always the apocalypse that i've assumed so I, I always tell a story about um back in like 2000 about 2012 when they were like all kinds of the world's gonna end in like december 21st 2012 and history channel and just running notre dame 2012 stuff just constantly and it was just really in this like guys so uh, as a joke, I, or I have to joke, I'm just like, yeah, I'll work a 24-hour shift. Um, so I'm just in the store uh, if, if anything was to happen on that day. And uh, they didn't let me do it. I only got to work overnight. But um, I know, like, I, in my head, I'm like, I know that if anything is to happen, I'm talking like anything. If they go on TV and say aliens evaded, if they go on TV and say the economy collapses and a, a gallon of milk is now $25 or $100 or something like that. I look for bread as $1,000 or, 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 you know what I mean? It's, um, if any hiccup, look what happened. Like, like, again, we say like toilet paper is flushed out in like a half an hour. So mm-hmm. if something, if something more serious happens, everyone is going to run to the store for resources. They're immediately counting everything that they have and how long that will last. So I know if I'm on the outside of the building, I cannot get in there. I don't, I don't own any guns. I don't like, I can't, it's the, the hierarchy is going to go for the people who are like, have the most weapons and are the most dangerous at the time. So I'm like, I can't bust my way in there. Once it, once it happens, I have to be in the building. And then once I'm in the building, I can kind of, um, Kevin McAllister home alone style, just like right. it's my house, it's my house. I have to defend it. Nobody knows the place better than I do. Um, I'm more comfortable in a sort of store than I am anywhere. And, uh, it's my best shot. At the very least, I can like hide in the hide in the attic and just survive off um, sneaking down to the back room and getting food that way. Um, but I didn't anticipate what it'd be like to have hundred people in the building um, and spiders crawling everywhere and wasps and everything. That's a little bit uh, trickier. Um, so basically, like <laughs> I don't know, I don't try, try, try to get in the most fortified spot possible, go into the open as little as possible, forward everything up as much as possible, and then just like you just got to think about traps, setting up traps. You have a million weapons, sticks and wooden pallets, and um, there's a lot of like you can fortify some very cool forts. Especially like again, like in my head, I'm always assuming it's me 
against a bunch of against a bunch of hundred Mad Max uh, post apocalypse freaks that are in the store. But a, a scenario where it's a hundred people working together against monsters, I think you could build some cool stuff. You can like stack up bales of cardboard and like you can really like fortify your defenses and create some cool stuff um, based on what you have around you. And there's all kinds of lighter fluid stuff. So that fire thing in theory could be better better um orchestrated and utilized yeah uh, i don't know is that uh is that a good enough answer um yeah no definitely i was just really curious about that too great, great question great question so one more quick question then would you rather be in a grocery store or would you rather be in one of those huge mega factories that where all the all the food stuffs come from oh uh, the warehouse yeah um uh just just for the for the for the poetry of like the supermarket being my home base and I, and I leave the option for like there being some um night warehouse worker some not some other version of me who's the best best warehouse clerk of all time and that's his home turf and he can he can hang up he can hang that like uh hang on to that you know i'll stick in my yeah. stick in my supermarket but i gotta say there's like literally like it's a weird thing and people aren't gonna roll with but i walk into any supermarket like i am kind of comfortable like i like it is kind of my element. I've been working at um, two different stores for uh, over half my life now at this point, since I was 15 or 16. Um, so uh, it, it's, it is, it's, my, it's my place. But it's also like super, super underutilized when it comes to um, stories and stuff. And like I have a million different ideas. Like I have a whole series of like tales from the aisle. Um, the aisles, like, mm. like it's spelled, spelled, like spelled A-I. Uh, right. L-E-S. Um, and just like you can do all kinds of stuff it's a, any any story you can think of can be shot through the supermarket prison and it really like uh it's all very untapped like the nice if, if i don't want to spoil too much of the nice stalker story but the name came from originally not me wanting to call in the shows but my superhero idea where it's like a buffy meets x files kind of meets like clerks mashup where the hell mouth is beneath the store it's kind of a monster of the week type scenario, different paranormal things being attracted to the store. Um, but like a higher grand big bad of like the kind of um, weird, like the store is in on it. They, they know and like every supermarket's type. I don't know, but just like, uh, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a great hub for creepiness. And uh, yeah, that's all I don't ramble, yeah. but. No, you're yeah. good. That's, that's a uh, good answers there. And, that's why I wanted to have you on the show. It was especially that, not only to the story and helping with the movie and everything, which is amazing, but, the, you know, just because how often do you get, you know, a story that then you can go to someone that's like, you know, kind of has some adjacent to real life sort of knowledge of how <laughs> yeah. things can go. So, I mean, um, this, 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 this really uh, couldn't be more of my alley. Like, I, it's just, uh, at least at the time, or like a few years ago, primarily. Uh, um, I mean, honestly, now still like we're we, we talk about Lovecraft all the, all the freaking time. So just Lovecrafting old ones and and supermarkets. Uh, it's 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 like central casting for me. You know, I wish I wrote it. But and what a weird synchronicity that like your favorite author wrote wrote the story and we're we're good friends and here we are. You know, yeah. It's gonna this this podcast gonna happen to two other people. Uh, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, brother. It's, it's always fun. Yeah, no, thank you for being here. And uh yeah, I think that'll do it. That's uh we gotta get going soon anyway. So Yeah, definitely, definitely. Got another um, show to go listen to. Thank you. Thank uh, you, thank, thank you, James. Thank you everybody for listening. Uh and uh hit me up next time you wanna uh cover a story. It's always fun. I'm I'll, I'll mute up now, good. but thank you, brother. Thank you. And that is Derek the Night Stalker. Again, S T O C K E R. It's because of the grocery store thing, and that's why I wanted to have him on here with me and uh, to, to do this show so um but yeah that's going to cover everything for today and uh i'll be back on saturday with another show and i'll talk to you all then on the next episode of salcedo paranormal take care everyone